Hi, so this is the talk that I'm giving <coughs> later today at the Crossicon, and it's titled Practical Approach to Cystic Lung Diseases. Uh, there is There are multiple classification systems, and um, one of the newer ones that's also being adopted by the uh, new guidelines is dividing the cystic lung diseases by etiology and so you have the tumors and then the development and congenital and the lymphoproliferative disorders etc <clears throat> but this does not help us when we are faced <clears throat> with a patient who has cystic lung disease so let's review that and figure out how when we are actually reporting scans we can we can figure out what's going on <clears throat> Diffuse cystic lung disease implies the presence of cysts which are distributed throughout the lung parenchyma, usually randomly. And it's good to be able to figure out how to differentiate these from other holes in the lungs such as bronchiectasis, emphysema, honeycombing and then figure out what next to do. But the first step is really this. Is this really diffuse cystic lung disease or cystic ILD? And so I've got a cystic lung disease, or a, a lymphoid interstitial pneumonia on the left, and then we'll have other entities on the right. So this is classic bronchiectasis, uh, branching cysts extending from the hilum to the periphery, these are centrilobular lucencies without walls, so that's centrilobular emphysema, and this is honeycombing, cysts with shared walls starting in the subpleural interstitium, usually multilayered, extending up to the hilum. Now, once we figured out that we're dealing with cystic lung disease, then the next question is or that what we're seeing are cysts. The next question is whether these are significant or not. Counting the cysts is not a bad idea. So typically, if we see a few cysts, about 10 or less, then they're usually not significant. So here is a 66-year-old for metastasis screening, and you see about uh, seven cysts here. And you can actually do thick minips uh, to reconfirm the number, and I'll come to that in a minute. These are not significant, and we can pretty much forget about these. So the cysts should be around more than 10, and when they are, then we try and see whether the it's only cystic disease and the intervening lung is otherwise normal, or are they cysts with nodules, so typically nodules within or nodules that have become cystic, or cysts with other findings. And if you have only cysts, then the differential is reasonably limited. You have lymphangiomyomatosis lamb, which is a neoplasm, and I've just put these in here to just let you know how they play out when we're looking at etiologies. Pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis is a neoplasm. Burtok dubay syndrome is now called folliculin associated ILD, that's genetic. Cysts of Sjogren's disease or follicular bronchiolitis, lymphoid interstitial pneumonia is a connective tissue disease, and cystic metastases, again, neoplasm. Now, cyst morphology matters, and I'll come to this again, but I'd like you to see this, that when a cyst is round, very well-defined margins, and obviously the rest of the lung is normal, then the most likely possibility is lamp. If the cysts are elliptical, paramediastinal, they're probably due to BHD. If they are septate, perivascular, more likely to be LIP. And if they're very irregular, that's what you see in PLCH. So let's start with PLCH. It's a neoplasm, more common in smokers. You get cysts or nodules with cysts. Um, and in non-smokers, you can get cystic disease if there is systemic LCH or systemic histiocytosis, as with Erdheim chester disease or any of the other ones. And the cysts are usually bizarre. So you can see here, 
ill-defined, I mean, well-defined cysts um, with well-defined walls, but very irregular, very bizarre. Sometimes you can mistake this for emphysema, but in emphysema, uh, you will not get um, walls, and that's how you have to differentiate one from the other. This 52-year-old ganja smoker who have cysts with walls randomly distributed throughout the lung parenchyma, and this would be typical of PLCH. Now, this was a patient I had seen during one of the KEM meetings, and this patient had a systemic histiocytosis. You can see these irregular, bizarre-shaped cysts, but the intervening lungs are normal. Lymphangiomyomatosis occurs almost always in women. They may occur in men if they have tuberous sclerosis, and we get very sharply marginated, rounded cysts. These people may present with pneumothoraces and almost always have elevated VEFGF levels. So, one of the w criteria tables that has been um, proposed is that if we see classic cysts, and then we have just one of any of these, then we can avoid a biopsy and we have a definitive diagnosis of LAM. So here are these classic round cysts in a woman that would be considered typical of LAM. And as I mentioned, those thick slab minips make a difference. So these are anywhere between 60 to 100 millimeter minips. So what they do is, and you have to do this on the soft tissue windows, not the HRCT windows, it really gives you a sense of how much is the burden of cystic disease, which you can appreciate from a single image, whereas it's a little tricky uh, to get that sense when you're just looking at the axial or the coronal images. And we do this, at least I do this now, for most of my cystic lung disease patients so that you have one snapshot giving us a sense of what's going on. The patients present with pneumothoraces, though you can have completely asymptomatic individuals. Here's the ICD tube here. And many of these patients have these additional findings. So this patient has rounded cysts, normal intervening lungs, but had these multiple lymphangiomas in the retroperitoneum, which in <clears throat> then we know um, so this is one more confirmatory finding that tells us that we're dealing with LAM. Then we come to LIP or cysts of Sjogren's disease, uh, women more than men. And while lymphoid interstitial pneumonia is um, common in Sjogren's disease, it is also seen in RA and SLE. Though it's the other way around, in patients with Sjogren, the commonest can, ILD is still NSIP. But if you take 100 patients of LIP, then Sjogren's is the commonest connective tissue disease causing LIP. Uh, this is a little contentious. Um, most people now believe that even if there are only cysts and the intervening lung is normal, you can still call it lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. So you can. Some people want to still say cysts of Sjogren. Some people will say LIP, and that's absolutely fine. Patients have to be followed up because they have an increased incidence of lymphoma. But this is your classic LIP: bizarre cysts, perivascular. Uh, reticular opacities, traction bronchiectasis, ground glass. So we have an interstitial lung disease with bizarre cysts in a patient who has Sjogren's. That is lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. BHT syndrome is now labeled follicular indeficient ILD in the new nomenclature guidelines. It's Bert Hogg Dubé syndrome after the people who discovered this condition. And it's the FLCN gene that is deficient. And you may have other systemic manifestations like skin lesions, renal pathologies. This is usually asymptomatic. Though our first understanding of um, this condition came from this patient who eventually was symptomatic and has multiple family members who have asymptomatic cystic lung disease. This patient uh, uh, came to us in 2009. We called it idiopathic cystic disease, um, was on follow-up, 
nothing much was happening no change in 2015 when scuba diving in hawaii had a pneumothorax airlifted to ucsf had a biopsy done proved bh proven bhd then had a, um, a, a genetic analysis done and then we learned about bhd then we had another patient who had similar idiopathic uh, cystic lung disease who's uh, cousins in canada started throwing pneumothoraces and then when they diagnosed bhd uh, this patient then turned out uh, or was labeled as bhd here and then since then it's the same um, uh, bader meinhof syndrome right now now we see bhd <laughs> everywhere when we're looking at cysts so this is another patient paramediastinal cyst this patient has had uh, pleurodesis here um and very classic appearance so while you see some rounded cysts here the moment you see these paramediastinal cysts that should raise the suspicion of follicular indefiscent ild and just to bring back this slide here that while the history the underlying disease all of that is important when we are actually looking at cases often we don't have history um this should raise in our minds suspicion of specific entities just based upon cyst morphology cystic metastases are simple it's very rare for these to be unknown so the patient will have an underlying malignancy usually renal cell squamous cell angiosarcoma of the scalp and then when we see these cysts often with uh, ground glass halos sometimes you have other nodules then this is reasonably typical of uh, cystic metastatic disease so these were the conditions where the intervening lungs are normal you have only cysts and so we use the history the presentation cyst morphology to try and come to a diagnosis then we have one set of entities where we have cysts with nodules and plch though it can be with intervening normal parenchyma and nothing else you can also get cysts and nodules here the other two amyloidosis and light chain deposition disease are lymphoproliferative and lip as i showed you earlier when you have associated findings like nodules ild then that's even easier a diagnosis to make now this patient again was a ganja smoker and you have nodules and cysts and plch presents initially as a nodular disease it's usually not picked up at that time this patient we did and you can see that some of the nodules are cavitating into cysts and eventually the patient just gave up smoking and was absolutely fine now this patient has what is called an aunt mini appearance very pathognomonic you've got cysts and there are nodules within the cysts that's very unusual and whenever we see nodules within the cysts that pretty much means amyloidosis or light chain disease and many of these nodules may also be calcified and then we have cysts with other findings in which case we have typically um, some form of additional interstitial lung disease and neurofibromatosis ild is genetic lam we already know about so you can see that conditions like lam um, can span all the three patterns you may have cysts with nodules you may have cysts with nothing else or you may have cysts with multiple other findings dip is now labeled as alveolar microphage pneumonia in the new guidelines but we can continue using the old terms for some time anyway so this patient has neurofibromatosis one if you're sharp you'll have seen the skin neuromas here the patient has cystic disease small cysts large cysts but also has an underlying um indeterminate or an ild which cannot otherwise be classified so there's ground glass reticular opacities and cysts now the commonest cystic disease that we actually see in practice is the cystic disease that occurs as part of other conditions such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis or sarcoid simply because hp sarcoid connective tissue diseases are so much commoner than the actual conditions that cause cystic lung disease so look at this patient with fibrotic hp in 
has ill-defined centrilobular nodules, traction bronchiectasis, ground glass. So we can make that diagnosis, and this would now be called bronchiolocentric interstitial pneumonia. In 2010, the patient has started developing cysts as part of either a reparative phenomenon or a healing process, but the cysts are there. And then in 2013 and 2015, the cysts have started increasing in size. So if you were to see the patient in 2015, you might be tempted to say that there is underlying cystic lung disease, but you should see that this is very asymmetric and there are other findings highly suggestive of um, um, an underlying interstitial lung disease. Having said that, if you only saw the 2015 scan, you might even have to put LIP as a differential and then wait to see if there is an underlying etiology like uh, Sjogren's. And if not, and then if everything fits in, then you would say that maybe this is consistent with fibrotic HP, and which is why old scans matter, because if then somebody gives you the 2008 scan, life becomes so much easier. Sarcoid, especially the chronic uh, fibrotic sarcoid, does tend to present with architectural distortion and some element of cystic disease. This is an extreme form with upper and mid-zone predominance. And again, either you need to have a history or you have to have earlier scans or you should have known the diagnosis to convincingly say that this is um, cystic disease related uh, to sarcoid. Then you can have bizarre uh, patterns. This patient presented with COVID and had these unusual nodules at the time. Um, and then three years later, when he came for a follow-up, we see these bizarre cysts. On the left, it almost looks like advanced confluent emphysema. But on the right, you can see well-defined confluent cysts. And it's just a form, I guess, of a reparative process uh, behaving in a weird manner in this particular patient. And so that's the flow chart. When we see diffuse lung cysts, the first thing we do is differentiate from other conditions that simulate cysts, like bronchiectasis, emphysema, honeycombing. And if the cysts are less than 10, you can pretty much ignore them. If they're more than 10, then figure out if they're only cysts, cysts with nodules or other findings, and then accordingly try and come to a differential. <clears throat> it is not usually common to be able to come to a diagnosis simply on the basis of the CT scan. You do need history. You do need a earlier scans. You need sometimes more information. But this allows us to give a reasonably intelligent differential when we are faced with these conditions. Uh, thank you.